evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here. We are very excited by your presence today at the 19th lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Jody Dean, Professor of Political Science at Hubert and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York, who is here to deliver the talk we are all looking forward to on becoming neo-feudal, the inner logic of communicative capitalism. We will be recording today's lecture and at the same time, it is being live streamed for our audience and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Dean's talk. And all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will then be addressed to Professor Dean. The lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. I request Simi ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor Dean. Right, thank you so much, Sakshi. Uh, Professor Jody Dean, our invited speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us from different parts of the world, I, on behalf of the Department of English at Jamia Millia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to you all to this Ministry of Education Spark Supported Distinguished Lecture Series. Friends, this is the 19th lecture of our series, and we are indeed fortunate to have with us Professor Jody Dean, one of the leading academics of our times, as our distinguished speaker this evening. It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Dean, and we are all eagerly waiting to hear her speak on becoming neo-feudal, the inner logic of communicative capitalism. I'm extremely thankful to Professor Dean for taking out time for us and for agreeing to be a part of our series. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. And now it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Dean formally. Professor Jody Dean is Professor of Political Science at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. She held the Donald, Donald R. Hutter 39 Professorship of the Humanities and Social Sciences from 2013 to 18. Professor Dean has also held the position of Erasmus Professor of the Humanities in the Faculty of Philosophy at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Her research interests include contemporary political theory, modern political theory, communism, theories of digital media, post-structuralism, psychoanalysis, feminist theory, political theory, and climate change. Professor Dean received her BA in history from Princeton University and MA and PhD from Columbia University before joining the Department of Science at Hobart and William, uh, Department of Political Science at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, Professor Dean taught at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She has held visiting research appointments at the Institute for the Human Sciences at Vienna, McGill University in Montreal and Cardiff University in Wales. Professor Dean is also an active member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation and a former co-editor of the Political Theory Journal Theory and event. She's the author or editor of 13 books, including Solidarity of Strangers, Feminism After Identity Politics, published in 1996, Aliens in America, Conspiracy Cultures from Outer Space to Cyberspace, 1998, Publicity Secret, How Ta Technoculture Capitalizes on Democracy, 2002, Zizek's Politics, 2006, Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, 2009, Block Theory, 2010, The Communist Horizon, 2012, Crowds and Party, 2016, and her latest, Comrade, an essay on political belonging in 2019. Emphasizing the use of Leninism, psychoanalysis in certain postmodernist theories, Professor Dean has made contributions to political theory, media studies, and third wave feminism, most notably with her theory of communicative capitalism, the online merging of democracy and capitalism into a single neoliberal formation that subverts the democratic impulses of the masses by valuing emotional expression over logical discourse. Professor Dean has spoken and lectured across countries like Austria, Canada, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Ecuador, England, uh, Germany, Hungary, Italy, and several others. And it's such an honor and such a pleasure for us to actually host Professor Dean. And we are so looking forward to the lecture that she's scheduled to deliver here. Over to you, Professor Dean. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm really honored to be part of your lecture series. It's just super delightful. So thank you all so very much. 
Um, and I'm, I'm excited to present um, this. This is new work um, to, um, tonight that I'm trying to bring together some of my earlier work on communicative capitalism with a diagnosis of, of current tendencies. So I'll be interested to see, you know, how, how it plays. Is it is it something that you that seems convincing or I should, you know, <laughs> file in this circular filing cabinet. So I'm, I'm looking forward also to the um, questions and discussion. So now I'm going to try to um, put up my PowerPoint and let's hope that this works smoothly, at least for the sake of the video. So here we go. Um, Let's see, wait a minute, share screen. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for the correct, oh, there we go, share screen. Okay, and here's this here. Okay, How's, is that looking normal? Is that looking the way it should look? Yes? It's fine, yes, okay. yes. All right, let me get this from the beginning. Okay, great, thanks. Um, in 2010, in the influential and prescient book, You Are Not a Gadget, Darren Lanier, who identifies as the father of virtual reality, he discussed the newly emergent cloud computing in terms of lords and peasants. The lords own and control platforms and data, the peasants or serfs are the rest of us who have become dependent on these platforms. Someone else owns the tools we need to do our work. Someone else, the platform lord, is the conduit or means through which we access the market. Someone else stores our data, charges us a fee for all this, and collects metadata about our transactions and use. Now, of course, Lanier wasn't yet able to trace out all these details of platformization but he identified the basic structure and dynamics right from the start. Under capitalism, the so-called sharing economy was always going to be about someone else making money. Over the next few years, the link between networked information technology and feudal social property relations solidified. Writing in the Harvard Business Review, Bruce Schneider, a network security expert, concluded a list of nefarious dealings by Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Twitter, and LinkedIn by pointing to the shift of power to IT. IT's dramatic increase in power, he said, was indicative of a digital feudalism. Schneider warned, if you've started to think of yourself as a hapless peasant in a Game of Thrones power struggle, you're more right than you realize. These are not traditional companies and we are not traditional customers. These are feudal lords and we are their vassals, peasants, and serfs." End quote. Most recently, Yanis Varoufakis, the economist and former Greek finance minister, has added his voice to the growing alarm, declaring techno-feudalism is taking over. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, um, isn't this obvious? Like, doesn't everybody already know that big, tech com that big tech controls the world and the rest of us are utterly dependent vassals? Like, it's not news that the wealth of tech billionaires increased by over $360 billion in the first year of the pandemic, a time when millions of workers lost their jobs or were forced, or were forced to stay at their jobs and risk their health and lives. The extreme inequality associated with our tech overlords is well known. What's surprising is how different this reality, this timeline is from the view of network digital communications 25 to 30 years ago. In the early 90s and even into the early 2000s, the internet was associated with democracy, citizen journalism, town hall for millions, transparency in government, and the opportunity for everyday people to make their voices heard. All this was going to usher in a golden age of political participation. Anyone with a laptop or cell phone would be able to get their message out without having to go through the censors, judgments, and hierarchies of gatekeeping institutions. Information would be free. Entrenched power struggles would crumb, power structures would crumble. The chains of tyranny would be lost. A primary buzzword for this democratic fantasy was participatory. Attaching the word participatory as a prefix heralded the revolutionary change in social relations the internet was bringing about 
participatory media, participatory journalism, participatory budgeting, participatory art, and so on. In the 90s, the internet was also associated with friction-free capitalism and a smooth world of flows. Observers as far apart as the neoliberal New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman and the communists Michael Hart and Antonio Negri shared the same technological imaginary of global horizontal productivity. Networked communications were to enable a new economy of abundance rather than scarcity. The productivity and creativity of the multitude would exceed and rupture state control. An oft repeated slogan announced, information wants to be free. Now, did this mean free as in unrestricted or free as in nobody has to pay for it? If it was the latter, how were content creators going to eat? The blurring or instability around everything being free on the internet was indicative of the larger, more fundamental equating of democracy and capitalism that the defeat of the USSR seemed to cement. The same infrastructure that let some people get rich in the dot-com bubble and would support the killer apps and big data rush in the 2000s, this made everybody freer. Um, you know, allegedly, right? Even better, networked person, networked personal, networked personalized media was fun. It turned work into play and users into producers. New media scholars like to throw around terms um, like pro "playber" and "prosumer" um, at that time. That is, consumer as producer, which really meant producing for capital without being compensated. Or, differently put, that capital had figured out how to extract value from processes of private consumption and use. At any rate, my point is that in the '90s. And even after the dot-com bubble burst and we moved into the 2000s, Web 2.0 communication technologies made capitalism acceptable, exciting, and cool, immunizing capitalism from critique by rendering critics into outmoded technophobes. Given that potent elixir of money, fun, and freedom, how did we get to our present timeline where networked personalized media is associated with neo-feudalism? That's the question I'm gonna answer in my talk tonight. And I'm gonna focus on two broad and interrelated dimensions of our setting in communicative capitalism. So, you know, broad, really broadly speaking, I'll talk about political economy and communication. And I'm gonna draw out the way that neo-feudalism isn't something abruptly new and different. It's a product of communicative capitalism's own dynamics. Like I said, 30 years ago, the promise of the internet was more democracy, abundance, and freedom. That fantasy unleashed a set of dynamics that have intensified inequality, undermined the shared understandings necessary for democracy, and enabled the rise of the far right around the world. Instead of an era guided by communicative action in a democratic public sphere, to use terms from Jürgen Habermas, expansions in networked and networked personal communications entrapped us in communicative capitalism, that era of capitalism where communication is central to production, distribution, circulation, and accumulation. Central, in other words, to capitalist processes, as well as to dynamics that we can usefully recognize as neo-feudalism. To get a sense of the depth and breadth of capitalism's merger with communication, consider, and I'm going to list like eight things, right? I'm, I just, and this is just to get the breadth and depth of this merger so that people are like, oh yeah, like this is true, this sucks. Okay, so, so on this list then, one, consider the complex logistics that support a trade system built on the concentration of industrial production in special economic zones. Two, the automation and informatization of productive processes that standardize and accelerate production while decreasing the need for human labor power. Three, the high-speed networks enabling algorithmic, algorithmic trading, hedging, and arbitrage in financial markets. Fourth, 
the injunction to in, to individuate and the corresponding overburdening of the individual form as ever more choices and responsibilities are downloaded onto the individual via personalized media. Fifth, the new capacity for capital to monitor and capture the activities through which we reproduce our social lives like big data and the internet of things. Six, platformization or the rise of platforms, the use of which generates data and income for the platform owners, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, and so on. Seven, the intensification and spread of surveillance. Eight, the intensification of work and expansion in time working as people are expected to be connected and responsive 24 seven. I mean, so I, I sometimes am concerned that, that super young people think that happened with COVID. It's like, no baby, that's been going on for like 20 years. Like as soon as everybody had a cell phone, we were on 24 seven. So all these features of the contemporary economy rely on the merger of information and communication systems with systems of production and distribution. The tech giants, Facebook, Google, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, they have become richer and more extractive. Their founders becoming billionaires on the basis of the cheap labor of their workers, the outsourcing of work to third party contractors, the free labor of their users, the tax breaks bestowed on them by cities desperate to attract jobs and the solidification of their monopolies. The extractive dimension of network technologies is pervasive, intrusive, and unavoidable. The tech giants have become masters of the entire process of social life. It might be an exaggeration to say that the present is literally an era of peasants and lords, but it is right to say that contemporary capitalist society is characterized by an intensification of inequality, more billionaires, greater distance between rich and poor, and the solidification of a differentiated legal architecture that protects corporations and the rich while it immiserates and incarcerates the working and lower class. Network society, you know, back in the day when people believed it was ushering in this, you know, wonderland or heaven on earth, it was going to be, it was, it was claimed that it was going to be horizontal, a flat world of interconnections and equal possibility. But as Albert Laszlo Barabasi's research on complex networks demonstrates, free choice, growth, and preferential attachment, the characteristics that define complex networks, they produce extremes of inequality. So I want to say a little bit more about these um, complex networks with their specific network characteristics. In complex networks, people voluntarily make links or choices. The number of links per item or site grows over time. And people like things because, because others like them. For example, seeing that someone has liked something on Facebook leads others to like it as well. Link distribution in complex networks follows a power law where the most popular item generally has twice as many hits or links as the second most popular, which has twice as many as the third most popular and so on, down to the insignificant differences among those in the long tail of the distribution, cur distribution curve. The one at the top has significantly more than the ones at the bottom. This winner take all or winner take most effect is the power law shape of the distribution. The shape that the distribution takes is not a bell curve, it's a long tail. A few billionaires, a billion precarious workers. As everybody knows, and this has been amplified during COVID. Now, a primary feature of communicative capitalism, complex, complex networks encourage inclusion. The more items in the network, the larger the rewards for those at the top. Growth is a characteristic as well as an aim. Complex networks also induce competition for attention, resources, money, jobs, anything that is given a network form. And they lead to concentration. That is to say hubs, monopolies, blockbusters, influencers. The result then, of free choice, growth, and preferential attachment is hierarchy. Power law distributions where those at the top have vastly more than those at the bottom. What this means is that complex networks have neo-feudalizing tendencies. 
inequality and hierarchy, that is power law distributions are built in. They're features, not bugs. So the first part of the answer to the question of how we got from the dream of democracy and equality to the reality of neo-feudalism is the logic of complex networks. This is how they work. This is the shape they take. This is their basic logic. Now, this does not mean that neo-feudalism is or was inevitable. I am not arguing that it was impossible for the internet to take any other shape or that there are no other ways to structure networks. There are definitely ways to design social networks to counter neo-feudalizing tendencies. To counter preferential attachment, for example, sites could just not report on how many people like something. They could not recommend things to us because others like them. Like if you think about old school library ca card catalog in a library, right? These, these card catalogs don't tell you how many people liked the books, right? They just tell you how to get the books. Netflix could list movies rather than recommend them to us because other people like them. And it's the same with Twitter, right? Twitter could simply not tell us how many followers a person has. Social networks choose how to rank or privilege post. It's a matter of algorithm design. Before 2009, Facebook, the Facebook feed was chronological. Then the algorithms were adjusted around popularity. And after that, they were individualized. And these are choices, right? Let's make, you know, the algorithms are designed to make us more attached to the platform. So they don't have to be the way that they are. TikTok takes preferential attachment to an extreme, combining several different preference measures, like time watching likes and comments, to determine which videos to push to whom and to create power law distributions, videos that stand out from the rest and go viral. So not inevitable, a series of choices. Likewise, the commercialization of the internet was not inevitable. The US could have worked through the UN, or with other countries to develop a fully public internet. It didn't have to transfer responsibility for, center, for supervising the internet, um, the internet backbone from the National Science Foundation's NSFNet to private corporations. Like this was not necessary, it wasn't required. It didn't have to do that. And it certainly didn't need to deregulate telecommunications in 1996. But that deregulation paved the way for the mergers and consolidations that, consol that concentrated media ownership into massive conglomerates. To make a long story short, networked media did not have to take the form of private property. It could have been protected as a commons or public utility. Instead of the dominant search engine being the creation and property of a corporation, it could have been publicly developed and funded like the internet was initially. This would have prevented the emergence of Google as an unfathomably wealthy company. Incidentally, its co-founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, increased their wealth by $65 billion during the first year of COVID. It's pretty likely that had the internet been public and heavily regulated, Facebook would not have emerged, at least not in its current form. It wouldn't have been able to sell advertising, which would have prevented Mark Zuckerberg from accumulating $100 billion. This leads me to one last example of something that was not inevitable. The collection of data and metadata and its treatment as a natural resource available for private appropriation. Corporations could have been prevented from collecting this data, from storing it, from selling it. There could be limits on server sizes, regulations preventing ser um, server farms, which are, uh, which are terribly environmentally damaging, given how much energy they use. Uh, if there were these kinds of regulations, that would de -incentivize, disincentivize data collection. So all these, algorithm design, commercialization, data gathering and storage, could have been and could still be different, but that's a political choice. It requires political will to change them, political will to undertake an enormous fight. So why hasn't there been a democratic upheaval? If networked communications have led to the intensification of monopoly power and widespread inequality, why aren't people using them to fight back? Well, first of all, they are. <laughs> Right, we have. There have been strikes, demonstrations, riots, and revolts all over the world in the last decades. Some have been associated with social media, 
like Iran's Twitter revolution in 2009, 2010, and Egypt's Facebook revolution in 2011. And most movements now have a social media component, as we know from Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, and last summer's um, widespread revolt in the US against racist police murder. People use, and I just spoke with someone yesterday who was talking about the success of the um, movement, the movement to legalize abortion in Colombia really relied heavily on TikTok. Um, so we see people using um, media to, um, you know, in the struggles, right? They aren't, people are not fighting against it. They're using it. Of course, people also criticize network media. Zuckerberg and the other tech lords have had to testify before U.S. congressional committees. People love to hate Mark Zuckerberg and point out the dangers of Instagram and Facebook. Liberals get especially incensed when Twitter and Facebook allow the uncensored circulation of misinformation. But at best, liberals call for regulation. They don't demand that the tech giants be seized and turned into public utilities. And the basic reason why is that mainstream politicians accept capitalism. They don't think that in principle it's wrong for there to be billionaires and media conglomerates with the power to scrape up, own, mine, and sell our personal information and then to charge us for doing this. If it's so bad, and to be honest, I actually, I think this is like the nice version. I think it's much, much worse. Like, but if it's this bad, why aren't millions of, the pe millions of people in the street demanding change regarding our social media or our, the platform overlords and our tech environment? Right. Why hasn't there been a significant movement for socializing the internet, right? Why hasn't there been a movement of like tens of millions rather than a few thousand? Because you can always point to critics and small scale, you know, groupings that, that argue for this. But why hasn't there been a mass movement? I think that the answer has to do with the way that networked personalized digital media has impacted communication. But I think its impacts on communication have immunized it. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now this rest, the rest of this. Most broadly put, our communication networks have become primarily affective networks. Networks more suited to the circulation of outrage than to debate and discussion. As I hope to make clear, my claim is that the changes in communication also drive neo-feudalization insofar as they fragment understanding and undermine meaning, thereby contributing to a world steered by intense images and feelings. So I'm gonna look at now three changes in communication characteristic of communicative capitalism. And the point of drawing out these three changes is now to start to draw out their um, neo-feudalizing tendencies. So the first part of my talk, I was emphasizing the merger of communication and capitalism. Now I wanna show how this merger has neo-feudalizing tendencies. Okay, so the three changes constitutive of communicative capitalism. First, um, a basic way to formulate the idea of communication um, is in terms of a message and its response. A message is delivered to a receiver, the receiver responds. In communicative capitalism, this changes. Messages are contributions to circulating content, not actions to elicit responses. The exchange value of the contribution overtakes the use value of the message. Meaning or use value matters less then the likelihood that a contribution will be shared. So whether a contribution is a lie, that doesn't matter. Right? People worry about this all the time. Oh, lies circulate on, uh, all the time on social media. But yes, that's right. Because, because lies circulate actually more quickly. Truth does not matter in this forum. Whether an article is ill-conceived doesn't matter. Like sometimes they're even written by freaking computers or algorithms. What matters is simply that something was expressed, that a comment was made, that an image was liked and shared. So this first change in, communica in communication that the concept of communicative capitalism designates is the shift from the use value of the message to the exchange or circulation value of the contribution. And this means that communication is subjected to an economic logic. All right, I'm gonna give an example of being ratioed on Twitter. Um, this refers to the presence of a high number of comments on a tweet. Typically, the high number of comments means a high level of disagreement in contrast with retweets, which generally but not always indicate agreement. 
the number, the aggregate right here in this example is like 73,000 um, comments. I mean, it's like 73,000 people, 73,000 are mad about this tweet and saying something angry back. Um, so typically the aggregate is what measures. The actual content of any given comment or the fact that the comments likely say wildly different things, that's eclipsed. And of course, a single tweets ratio, like this one tweets ratio, that gets eclipsed, eclipsed by what trends. Like, I don't even know if anybody even remembers this guy, Donald Trump, anymore. Like everything gets, um, gets eclipsed. Things are forgotten in just a matter of hours. In social media, something well argued, true and important to a matter of real concern, rarely or barely registers. Because the stream of contributions is endless. It's constant. Something else that is true and important will not just appear tomorrow, but it's appearing right now at the same time in the same feed, making the same demands on our attention. As equal contributions to circuits of information and affect, then the content of our utterances is unimportant. What matters is their mobility, their capacity to circulate. Dissent is just one more content, whether cogently argued or the daily outrage. What's the point of critique then if it won't, if it can't register? Communicative capitalism undermines critiques, conditions of possibility. There was a, um, a recent movie that um, came out, um, Don't Look Up, was um, really draws out this undermining of the possibility of, of critiques. So that's a popular version of the same argument. Okay, so that was the first point. Second change. Um, and this one follows directly from the shift to circulation value. And that's the communicative equivalent of utterances. In communicative capitalism, messages, right? Communicative utterances, status updates, contributions, likes, shares, tweets, um, all of these are communicatively equivalent. Algorithms might weigh them differently, but in our feeds and in the counts that we see, any share is equal to any other share. A tweet got 150 retweets. In that count of 150, each share is equal to any other share. Each counts for one. Each registers as having been made. Any one of 2,000 likes is equal to any other like. The release of a new game is equivalent to the deaths of over 800,000 people. You know, and this might seem like an extreme, uh, extreme set of examples, but but for educators, like in classrooms um, or in groups, we often tend to value the success as by the number of people who participated. Right, what counts as engagement? So it's often often like like after a, a class, I'll talk to a, you know a colleague, and they're like, "How'd your class go?" It's like, "Oh, great! Like nearly everybody spoke." Well, like. Like that doesn't say anything about the quality of the discussion. It just says that everybody said something. That's the same kind of logic where there's a communicative equivalent of utterances. The channels through which we communicate reward number. The more hits and shares, the better. Quantity defeats quality, as, which is already, we already know this from commodity production and fast food. It's now clear to everyone that the circulation capacity of outrage vastly exceeds that of cogent arguments. Reaction time is shortened, responding is easier. In a setting of constant, unceasing, infinite, and ever intensing demand, ever intensifying demands on our attention, we don't have time to respond to everything, to evaluate everything, to reflect. Nuance takes too long. Like science doesn't register, like as we saw in the movie, Don't Look Up. What registers is intensity whether it's outrage, absurdity, cuteness, or reassuring cliches, which are easy to recognize, making at least some people feel at home, like, oh, I finally get what social media is about. You don't argue with a meme, you rant through a meme, hoping to impact someone enough that they will share it or copy it. But even this will be transient, a momentary dopamine hit that won't last long and that will dissolve in the larger flow. The networks of communicative capitalism are affective because images and emotions circulate more rapidly than ideas. It's easier to share the photo of the scared koala on the edge of a burning forest than it is an article about Australia's increased commitment to fossil fuel extraction. 
And it's easier because one because one's decision about sharing it can happen rapidly. Avoiding the time sink of reading and evaluating the accuracy of the claims in, say, an academic article on Australian extractivism. And one can expect that others will affirm this decision with likes and shares. Like, like what sort of awful person doesn't care about koalas and then close to extinction koalas because of burning uh, Australian forests? But, you know, like, why did people ever think that a communication terrain promising to include everyone and enable anyone to say anything at any time would be a good idea. Everyone includes hucksters and trolls as much as it does female identified artisans and sincere rural teenagers. It includes flat earthers and fascists as much as it does quantum physicists and communists. For the most part, this kind of openness was less unsettling when media had distribution limits, when it took effort to tune into the controversial radio show or locate the banned book. In other words, the fact of dramatically divergent views of reality is less unsettling in analog than it is in digital. Digital communication has resulted in a decline of symbolic efficiency, which is an expression I get from Slavoj Žižek. Symbols points of reference that signify one way in one field means something entirely um, different in another one. And there's no way to stabilize meaning or provide a decisive determination, right? And in the Lacanian jargon, this means that the way to say this is the big other doesn't exist. Another way I usually play um, say it is division goes all the way down. This decline of symbolic efficiency is the third key feature of communicative capitalism. In digital communication networks, we regularly confront myriad others whose views of reality differ from our own. Our disagreements are not just matters of taste and opinion. They're not even just about morality and the good life. Disagreements are about reality itself. Now, these have always been there, but networks, digital communication networks bring us into contact with them, like all the time, anti-vaxxers, denialists of all stripes, anti-communists, the endless array of cynics and nihilists, influencers whose every upload try to, tries to sell us something. All news is fake to somebody. Trump didn't invent all this. The decline of symbolic efficiency is an attribute of communicative capitalism, one of the ways that a previous symbolic order has fragmented into antagonistic parts. In the US, the pandemic and the 2020 election have forced us to confront this decline in symbolic efficiency. There is no big other that tells us whether the virus is real, whether masks work, vaccines are safe, and who won the election. In my view, it is wrong to say that these are merely political disagreements. Um, the political disagreements arise from the material change in communication. The absence of the big other isn't liberating, it's frustrating, suffocating, a kind of closure where significant action is impossible. In fact, the politics itself isn't clear. The pandemic and the 2020 election involve all sorts of blurring of left and right. Our setting is not one of symbolic efficiency where we can map these sides with any certainty. Some users have adapted to this disorienting cacophony of the decline of symbolic efficiency through the careful curation of their feeds. Already in his 1995 book, Being Digital, Nicholas Negroponte predicted that networked media would enable users to pick and choose what sort of information we wanted to consume. He worried that this would, could diminish encounters with unexpected, unsearched for stories. 30 years later, after enduring flame wars, trolls, gamergate, bullying, gaslighting, streams of lies and hate, not to mention privacy, violating, privacy violations and countless ads, now social media, social media users tailor their lists of friends and followers, hoping for interactions that won't amplify the low level outrage that's becoming communicative capitalism's primary affect. Even as some call out for Facebook and Twitter to do this culling for them, to protect them from fake news as if these capitalist corporations should determine for us all the meanings of fake and news, many form groups, tribes, and bubbles. 
They seek out those whose interests or experiences may be similar, who face the same kind of challenges, be they challenges around a particularly complicated recipe, navigating complex bureaucracies, or dealing with substantial trauma or loss. The necessity of these, of these affiliations is attested to by the vehemence with which they are defended. From competing fandoms to the reflex to cancel, defending the fortress that protects who one is has become an imperative, experienced as a matter of life and death. The politically engaged seek out allies, comrades, and fellow travelers. Some liberal analysts criticize these information silos. Operating as if the ideal of a public sphere were operative, were operative online, they encourage users to seek out those with whom they disagree, engage them, and look for common ground. One wonders if these liberals are disingenuous or have they never been online. Networked digital interactions with those outside one's bubble lack the shared understanding necessary for political discussion. Reality is not the same. Words mean different things. Siloing bubbles make sense as a response to the absence of shared meaning in digital networks. Like-minded comrades provide necessary support against the ceaseless waves of outrage. Fragmentation and polarization are a mass adaptive response, are a mass adaptive response to the decline of symbolic efficiency, not an individual failing. The shift from meaning to circulation, that is, from message to contribution, from use value to exchange value, the communicative equivalence of utterances and the decline of symbolic efficiency impacts the kind of people we are and the kind of communities we can create. Differently put, communication is a material dimension of the production and reproduction of life. Now more than ever, it's part of the base as well as the superstructure. We could say it's the infrastructure, connecting, bridging, meshing base and superstructure. In the affective networks of communicative capitalism, there is no commonly shared meaning. Lies circulate more easily than truth, especially when there's nothing to stabilize or guarantee truth, no generally accepted procedures of veridification. Outrage trumps reason and nuance. With constant communication, but maddening incommunicability, we lose the sense, not just that one hears us, but that if they do, there's no way for them to understand us. Meaning is individuated, what matters to me, what I experience, what I feel. Under these conditions of the decline of symbolic efficiency, disparate issues and concerns are equalized. The daily death, deaths of thousands circulating in the same media space as fury over a language faux pas and straight up lies. Little registers as significant or everything is equally significant because, significant, because signification has become so elusive. This fragmentation of the symbolic is a dimension of the parcelization of sovereignty, one of the key features of, of neo-feudalism that I'm going to take up now in the very last part of my talk. The idea of, par um, the idea of parcelated sovereignty um, appears in various accounts of European feudalism. I got it from Perry Anderson and Ellen Mikeson's Wood. Feudal social relations in Europe lacked a centralized public power. Economic and political power were intermesh. Lords both administered laws over peasants and expropriated the proceeds of peasants' labor. Political and economic co coercion blended together. They were one form, they weren't separate. In the 21st century, we encounter similar phenomena across the globe. Economic preda predation, what Robert Brenner calls the politically driven upward redistribution of wealth is, is, this, is the way this, um, is the way this um, manifests, right? So the economic and political merge through this kind of, of politically driven upward redistribution of wealth. Amazon is a good example here. People probably recall that it created um, in the US, maybe you don't, but in the US they, um, it was a big deal that, Econ uh, that Amazon created a competition between different cities over which city would be a new location for their headquarters. And this and so cities competed with each other to see who would give Amazon the most tax breaks, um, who would give them the most to come there. Um, um, Uber is another example. Uber um, straight up breaks the law. They enter into cities in violation of the city's livery laws. 
illegally undercutting prices. And they spread so quickly that cities have a terrible, actually impossible time trying to maintain their taxi um, system. And Uber then absorbs the costs, which are usually minimal from any lawsuits. These are examples of the blending of political and economic power that exemplify parcelated sovereignty of the parcelated sovereignty of contemporary neo-feudalism. And there's zillions of other examples of this. Maybe we can talk about this in the, in the chat. Two other characteristics of neo-feudalism are the Lord Surf relations I mentioned at the beginning. That is the extreme inequality that accompanies platform, platform dependence. And second, hinterlandization, or the emergence of vast landscapes of despair that are both symptomatic of breakdown and capital flight and sites for giant distribution hubs, server farms, and call centers. Neo-feudalism's lords, serfs, and hinterlands are not separate from communicative capitalism. They're produced by communi communicative capitalism. And this for, now I want to look at this fourth um, and the fourth characteristic will return me to the affective dimension of communicative capitalism, the decline of symbolic efficiency. Our setting is one of extremes and inequal, of inequality and dependence, but generalized in, in communicability. It's like cries for help don't register. Demands for change seem inadequate. Someone will immediately contradict us or deflect us. We get overloaded by pervasive feelings of insecurity, anxiety, and catastrophe, overloaded because there's no relief, no redress, no escape. Amer Hook describes the average American lacking a savings or a social net safety net necessary for weathering everyday crises like um, a medical emergency or home repair. He describes the, uh, this average American this way. Life is marked by constant dread and anxiety and panic, not over anything that might come to be, but over things that must be, things for, things for which there is no escape, like death, birth, and illness. Simply existing itself is a task, an ever-growing burden, both economic and psychic. Huck sees the average American as a powerless neo-surf. He describes this neo-surf as a creation unique in modern history, a nominal citizen of a rich country, but one whose every imaginable, imaginable possibility goes on shrinking by the day because he is impotent, castrated, every day can only feel something like either torment or death. Um, so dreary, but yeah. Um, people have good reasons for feeling insecure, right? This anxiety and catastrophism, it's not just like some sort of fantasy world. It's real. There are real reasons for people to feel like this. Um, the catastrophe of neo-feudal capitalism's expropriation of the social surplus in the setting of a grossly unequal and warming planet is real. In her book on low-wage low-waged work in call centers, fast food, retail, and Amazon warehouses, Emily Gwendelsberger describes the stress caused by constant technological surveillance on the job, the risk of being fired for being a few seconds late, for not meeting the quotas, for using the bathroom too many times, repetitive, low-control, high-stress work like that associated with work that is technologically monitored corrects, cor correlates directly with depression and anxiety. Uncertain schedules, lauded as flexible, unreliable pay because wage theft is ubiquitous. These are deadening and stressful. And for some, neo-feudal apocalypticism is individual, it's familial, it's local. I mean, it can be really hard to get worked up over climate change when you've lived catastrophe for a few generations. Huck's emphasis on the regressive politics of contemporary anti-revolutions makes the link between catastrophism and feudalism. Trumpism, he writes, hopes to make today's impoverished, powerless neo-surf tomorrow's little tribal master over immigrants and minorities. Feudalism is the goal of these anti-revolutions in which the neo-surf becomes a chieftain in his own right, one of the pure in a promised land. Huck's analysis lets us see the appeal of neo-feudalism to those without control. If one isn't free to control another person, one isn't free. So it's no wonder then that many of us lose the capacity to accept ambiguity, grabbing instead for an impossible certainty, 
even when, especially when it's not widely shared, but a secret cherished by a chosen few. Um, we've seen this in the US in this whole conspiracy around this Q figure, but also um, um, globally, there's a rise in the primacy of profits, in infatuations with witches and witchcraft. And then you've got all those crypto guys going on about blockchain, which I just put in the same, in the same bundle. To conclude, I've argued that communicative capitalism leads to neo-feudalism. And this is a grim story. It reminds us that the internet is for capitalism, not democracy. It tells us that the problems of fake news and anti-vaxxers and a stolen election and all that's pushed on us as new and different are actually features baked into our now fundamental means of communication. My analysis attunes us to the limits of critique in a setting where truths and lies are communicatively equivalent. And I hope it models a method of media analysis oriented, oriented to the political economy of form over any aesthetic or even political evaluation of content. So that's my presentation and I, I look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Dean. That was such a, what should one say, such an urgent talk that we all, I think, needed to hear. I think this talks to all of us, you know, and like you said, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a grim picture, but it's a grim picture that I think we all need to probably come to terms with and think about how we can at all, if at all, we can negotiate the space. But I think what you've outlined for us is extremely important because for us to understand that from, you know, the kind of promised land that internet was promised to us as you know, a few decades back as, as, a, as, a, as a place of democracy, as a place of choice and free exchange, et cetera, et cetera. All that, you know, panacea is something that, that is obviously not, not the real that we encounter today. But I think what, you, what, you, what you've outlined for us in terms of talking about that it's communicative capitalism, and if ultimately, I mean, what you said, that uh, the, the production and reproduction, and since you did invoke, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and superstructure, and this has become really the, means of communication or the or the uh, or the you know the means of communication or even the relations of communication so to say have become the real means through which any exchange becomes possible or takes place today then what is the kind of agency which is at all possible before us because uh, as you as you absolutely you know rightly pointed out that the product of i mean new feudalism is certainly a product of of uh, communicative capitalism and ultimately if it has given rise to you know instead of uh, little silos that we, have, we may have created for ourselves of exchange and discussion, but ultimately only given rise to intensities and to affect and to, to, to the idea of outrage, but ultimately all of that get exchanged in a place where there are equivalences and there's a leveling of all these discourses, then what is the way out really for us to find a voice which will be able to, uh, you know, uh, one may talk about, you know, examples which we certainly want to uphold, you know, as you know, you did talk about social media playing a very important role, you know, whether it was in the Arab Spring or, you know, we can all think of examples from our own quarters in 2010 in Kashmir, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, it all does get drowned in this, you know, in this uh, algorithmic universe of big data, and we're all being mined whether we like it or not, you know. And so uh, it is a worrying sign. And I think all the symptoms that we are seeing of what you talk about in terms of, you know, what has happened to uh, to us in terms of, you know, expropriation, not just of social surplus, but political surplus, or even cultural surplus, or everything in terms of, you know, uh, a certain kind of a uh, a certain kind of a, a way in which we, we are all prone to anxiety and stresses which are a product of our times in some senses. Uh, you know, there is no possibility of any kind of a consciousness uh, if we are only reduced to intensities. You know, there's no possibility of, and there's no possibility then of even a political consciousness which can actually uh, give us some sort of a solidarity or some possibility of, of a movement or grouping. So I think we need to really think about our politics and ethics and, you know, what we constitute as what, what may be thought of as social or political in today's time, you know, and, and thank you so much, Professor Dean. It's such a such an important talk for, for our times. And, you know, it's something that we have to deal with, whether we like it or not. But, 
you know, I'm really grateful to you, Professor Dean, for laying that out so well for us. I mean, we do talk about this in our quarters, but you know, you laid it out so, 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 so. You know, I mean, it was urgent and important and immediate, and and it was something that was really needed. And I think we all need to get shocked out of what we are constantly dealing with uh, in in the universes that we occupy. But thank you so much, Professor Dean. And I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions and uh, comments that people will have, and we'd like to hear your responses. So I'm going to ask my dear friend and colleague, uh, Sakshi Dobra, to take over and pose the questions to you. And then, you know, maybe we can have a, have a, have a, have a, have a chat and exchange. Thank you so much, Professor Dean, for that very engaging talk. I can see that my chat box is brimming with questions. If you agree, shall I post the first question that I see here? Um, this question is by Dr. Adwar Shah. He says, Professor Dean, we can't thank you enough for bringing such a topic that touches everybody's skin today. We understand that data is the new oil and how masses have been reduced, rather manufactured into the data by big data firms. Do you believe there is a clear but an unusual link between such a communicative capitalism, moral regulation, and desecularization is such a merger or networking antithesis or synthesis of democracy in the modern era? Um, would, I, I hate to ask you this, but um, can you read it one more time? Because I was distracted and thought that I was supposed to read it on the screen. And so I was looking around to see if I could read it at the same time. And so I'm gonna turn the words off on my screen so I'm just listening. Um, sorry for that inconvenience. Not at all, not at all, Professor Dean. Uh, this is the question by Dr. Adwar Shah. He says, Professor Dean, we can't thank you enough for bringing such a topic that touches everybody's skin today. We understand that data is the new oil and how masses have been reduced, rather manufactured into the data by big data firms. Do you believe there is a clear but an unusual link between such a communicative capitalism, moral regulation and desecularization? Is such a merger, networking, antithesis, or synthesis of democracy in the modern era? Um, I think that's a, a that's a really um, smart and knowledgeable question, and I appreciate that. I think that um, there has. I, I think there has got to be a link to desecularization. That strikes me as is really on point and not something that um, that I talked about. But I would think that the way that people try to um, shore, to basically to try to find um, bubbles of meaning or shoring a shoring up of a symbolic world with which they have some kind of certainty. Um, fits in as a symptom and response to the overall decline of symbolic efficiency. So what goes with, so we'd say on the one hand, there's massive decline of this common um, symbolic order, and then the reintensification of orders in which people can hold on to themselves. And that would be, I think, fit with a return to forms, um, just forms of religion um, that before people might have had a more distant relationship to now becomes like absolutely um, necessary containers for their for their identity, for their sense of being in the world, for their ability to find or make meaning. Um, yeah, so I think the desecularization um, um, point is, is very well taken. Thank you, Professor Dean. <clears throat> I see a question here by Zahid Zamir, uh, Zamri. He says, I'm Zahid Zamri from Malaysia. Can you please explain further on the slave serf mentality that haunts the multitude within the neo feudal communicative capitalism? Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, I want to first, I want to, I want to just, I want to separate out slave. Um, and in part, that's because of the, the specificity of the um, American context um, and the discussion of, of enslaved workers um, here. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize serfs. And one of the reasons I want to emphasize um, serfs and, and, and um, as part of this neo-feudalism is because serfs have a degree of self-sufficiency. Like they have access to their means of, of means of life and their means of production, but right? they are able, they use their tools for the benefit of the master in ways like, um, you know, like say Uber drivers um, do, it's their cars. So the, so the first thing is separate slave and serf and recognize that there's something where serfs um, still are a degree I have a degree of autonomy um, because they have some kind of owners. 
first part. Second part, I, I think it's important to think about then with that idea, how on the one hand, we're not serfs in the same way like European serfs were serfs make, you know, um, working on land and really having means of production. We, as in people um, who are depend on platforms for our livelihoods, are actually um, more proletarianized in that we don't eat by, like an Uber driver doesn't just eat by driving, an Uber driver gets money in order to buy commodities to eat. So we've got a degree of reflexivity here, a degree of, of, of turning. It's not like the previous mode of commodity production is gone. We're still dependent on commodities and markets, but now all of the responsibilities for the tools and the organization of labor and the one they've been split again. So the uh, so capitalists don't own the means of production. We own the means of production, but they own our access to markets. And so there's a, a, a different kind of separation of the worker from the from the conditions of work. Like you see, Marx talks about this in the Grundrisse, these sort of forms of, of separation. So now we have a different kind of separation where the means of production are now ours, but our access to the market is taken away. I think that, so a lot of my analysis on this part is, is meant to be, um, is not, doesn't tell us very much about the mentality of serfs. It tells about the conditions of work and the, the, and the larger political, and the larger economic conditions in which we find ourselves. And I think they're different. There seems like there are always different ways that mentalities respond to this. Some of them are mentalities that feel so disempowered that the only way they can feel like subjects again is by having power over or being able to feel themselves as powerful beings. And this is the stuff that I was citing at the end from a writer named Amir Huck, who emphasizes the how this kind of appeal of neo-feudal logics to, um, to people is like, now they get to have power over other people. And they did this through Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump let them feel like they could always go around saying, you're fired, you're fired, even if they couldn't. It became a, a point you know, of transferential identification. Um, I think that's part of the, of the surf mentality. But there are other parts, which is a kind of feeling of, of being in perpetual servitude and always having to be of service to others. Like every aspect of one's being is serving another. And so people become more subservient and subservience becomes expected. I mean, it means like, like this, you see this in, in a lot of, of fast food work where the, not only are the people supposed to hand you the food, but they're supposed to smile and be happy and act like, oh, here, we're working for you in this sweet, adorable way. Don't you love us? We're caring for you, blah, 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 blah. So subservience now supposed, it gets sort of layered into and embedded into um, interactions in ways that's not just, that's just being polite, right? It's being um, sort of obsequious. And that's required. So I would say that those would at least be two aspects of the ways that the new, um, that these neo-feudalizing tendencies start to manifest in people's, let's say in, in our subjectivities. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. Uh, with your permission, uh, can I pose another question or two? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. There is a question here by uh, Manjira. She, she says, first of all, loved your lecture. And I agree with what you said. Even though it's a reality I like to avoid, it's undeniable how deep we are in this entertainment and information matrix. Because all the information we consume, a, a lot of our ideas, perceptions, economic and social relations, etc., are manipulated. And we are almost in this kind of simulacra. The possibility that there is an alternative to capitalism, even in imaginative world is being removed. I think it's growing in uh, uh, an even scarier direction after COVID. The, mo the moment uh, one sits down and analyzes the situation, capitalism has already evolved. In those situations, as people who are aware of how deep we are into this pervasive network, what can we do to resist the flow? Oh, geez, that's the real question, right? Like that's 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 the question. So, um, you know, I, I mean, the the easy answer, well, is is of course a global proletarian revolution, but that seems like a little bit too easy because how do you build that, right? How do you get there? How is this possible? Um, I want to. I can point to two 
aspects of our current situation that I think might be helpful. Um, one of those is recognizing the um, that this that we, we I talked about this with the desecularization part, and it's easy for us to see desecularization um, to analyze that critically because we think about the rise of fundamentalisms and forms of fascism. But we can also see that in terms of of um, I would say communist, but one would say communist or socialist or progressive or emancipatory, liberatory bubbles, right? Liberatory groups, groups that are willing to, to that, that share common meaning and that are willing to fight for that meaning. And so the same phenomena that, that scares us on the right and that scares liberals across the board should be held up by people on the left and further, right? We have to get rid, we have to abandon the liberal democratic mindset that we influence the entire public and that we have to um, debate with our enemies and instead strengthen the ties and get those around us to be more willing to fight, strengthen those relationships. And I actually think that has been happening as well over the last 10 or 15 years when we see movements in the streets and the global dimensions of that, when we recognize them across the world, people feel empowered with that. So I think the same tendencies that are really negative when looked at, say, from the standpoint of a liberal um, democratic public sphere, we can hold on to moments that we can um, use as building strength, as bubble, building strength, bubbles of strength. So that's one version. One, it lays sight, you know, sight within the present of possibilities for emancipatory organizing. Another one is um, and I loved what um, uh, what Simi said earlier with like, there's no consciousness if it's just intensities. And I think that's so important and absolutely right. And so one of the things that we do in our groupings, what I've been calling these like, you know, bubbles or tribes, parties, is strengthen each other as agents and ourselves as collective agents. And then we get away from just the circulations of intensities and in fact, refocus what we're doing. So, uh, and one other thing is, I think the more that we work in our, in our bubbles and our parties, the more that we realize like, you know what, as an individual, my stuff isn't actually that important. What matters is strengthening this group, this collective as a fighting group and a fighting collective. And so in some ways, the dissolution of the importance of my one speech act, the fact that it's communicatively equivalent to every other one is good because it's a way of breaking through the bad version of individualism that we have in favor of building capacities for agency because we don't become limited in this view of just like, like, agency is just the property of a person, a single person. No, it's a property of collectivities. So I think that we can look to those aspects and say, okay, we've identified these elements. Let's strengthen these. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. Shall I take one last question, if you agree? Sure. Uh, there's a question here by Fezan. He says, thank you for the insightful analysis. How do you see communicative capitalism in context of Russia-Ukraine war, where social platforms, especially TikTok, are being used for circulation of what you called contribution? Um, first, I have to say something. Um, this is like a little, maybe a little too personal, but um, my... Um, my kids, or I have a son and a daughter, and they're now um, grown, like they're in their 20s and don't live at home anymore. And so I don't know as much about social media as I did when they were living at home. And so I've actually not seen any of these um, TikToks from the war. And so I feel, I feel like, oh no, like I'm just, now I'm just like this old disconnected person who doesn't know all of these things. I can like make good gestures to them, but like in terms of the real experiential phenomenological aspect, I don't have a good answer for it. But so that's, but I'll put that aside. That's just like merely personal. Um, what we, I think that, um, so first, if we step back for a second, I think we all know that part of all war is different disinformation and misinformation campaigns. That's as old as warfare itself. Um, every war has that element. It may, it's intensified now because it's peoples are much more engaged on, in it on their own. Um, and participating in on their own, it seems like there's almost like popular versions, um, you know, like, like misinformation and disinformation kind of from below rather than necessarily from above. That doesn't tell us how to navigate that. Um, 
and I, so so that's the first so I, th I think one way to think about it is, not, is to not sort of singularize it as um as a specific aspect i also uh, i also I, I have to say i'm deeply concerned with the way that um a enthusiasm for supporting um ukraine who has been you know clearly um you know, invaded by another country. It takes also takes the form of acting as if there have been no other wars, <laughs> no other wars around the world, no other wars in Europe, even no other refugees, no other um, um, mass process, mass instances of refugees. Um, I mean. It's like, how is it the case that this same Europe that was letting people die in the Mediterranean, wash up on the beaches, now is embracing all of these white refugees and not even the refugees of color, like black Ukrainians have not been um, given the same kinds of access. So um, that's not the same point that, that you raised, but I, I think that there's a some of the affective intensity around the mobilization um, in the US is in part like, fortunately, here's a war where we're not visible as the aggressors and, and the invisibility in the US of NATO's own provocations here goes um, usually unstated. Um, but there's an enthusiasm um, of, we get to enjoy the, the rush of war without you know, being the global aggressor. There's the mobilization of hatred of Russia, which is a long time um, coming. And there is the circulation of real pictures of real suffering, as if a real picture of real suffering tells you exactly what the politics of that suffering is. And I think that we see like this, the, the affective circulation draw, um, displaces you know, global political analysis. And, but, but there's always, there's always, and I'm not trying to diminish the suffering. I just want that we should see how it, circulates in a way that is um, displaces the analysis. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. Thank you so much for your time, for your elaborate uh, responses. Uh, if I could now request uh, Zahra Rizvi to deliver an official vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. It has been a wonderful event indeed and on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made this event successful. First and foremost, our gratitude to our speaker, Professor Dean, who's been so kind to us by giving us so much of her time and sharing her scholarship with us. Thank you so much. We will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time in the near future. As always, I would like to thank our HOD, Professor Samima Malhotra, who is the leading force behind this lecture series and today's talk. Thank you also to Shraddha Suman Sakshi and everyone on the organizing team who are always responsible for running our events so smoothly. And thank you finally to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. So grateful. So grateful. Uh, so Y'all have been wonderful. I just this has just been lovely and wonderful. Thank you so much. This was so important for us. Thank you so much, Professor Dean. Thank you.